Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Daniel Siebold, Acting Dean of the Hofstra College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. On behalf of the college, I welcome you to the spring 2021 Donald J. Sutherland Lecture. The late Donald Sutherland established a distinguished and successful business career as an entrepreneur. A native of Long Island, he graduated from Princeton in 1953 and he received an MBA from Harvard in 1958. In the 1970s, he founded Quincy Partners, one of the first leveraged buyout firms. From 1985 to 1987, Mr. Sutherland was the president of the Joffrey Ballet. He was also a trustee of the Joffrey, a governor of the New School for Social Research, and a trustee of Hofstra University. Since 1998, when Mr. Sutherland established this lecture series, speakers have included poet Robert Pinsky, novelist Salman Rushdie, presidential biographer Robert Caro, historian Deborah Lipstadt, and former U.S. Senator Joe Lieberman. Hofstra College is grateful for Mr. Sutherland's generosity, and we thank the members of the Sutherland family for their continued support of the college. Today, we continue the best traditions of the Donald J. Sutherland Lecture with a timely lecture on trust. To introduce our speaker, I now recognize Dr. Amy Baer, Professor and Chairperson of the Hofstra Department of Philosophy. Good afternoon. I am very pleased to introduce to you the spring 2021 Sutherland Lecturer, Professor Kevin Vallier. Professor Vallier is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Bowling Green State University. He writes and teaches in the areas of political philosophy, ethics, and the philosophy of religion, as well as in a field that has come to be called philosophy, politics, and economics, also known as PPE. PPE brings intellectual resources from economics, political science, and philosophy to bear on our understanding of the institutions of our political and economic life. At Bowling Green State University, Professor Vallier directs a novel PPE program for undergraduates, uh, which adds a focus also on law. Professor Vallier has written three books and edited four volumes, and he is author of more than 40 peer-reviewed book chapters and journal articles. His books include Liberal Politics and Public Faith from 2014, Must Politics Be War? Restoring Our Trust in the Open Society, 2019, and Trust in a Polarized Age, published in 2020. This latter book is the basis for Professor Vallier's talk today. I have taught at uh, I have taught political philosophy and philosophy of law at Hofstra for 19 years. In my classes, I explore with students the difficult and important question of how society's basic institutions should be arranged and how state power should be used. A major challenge in the classroom has always been how to talk across political differences, how to talk in a way that is respectful and productive. As students who have taken my classes will know, doing that and doing that well is important, is as important to student learning as it is to our public civic life. I very much look forward to Prof Professor Vallier's insights and guidance concerning how we might as a society understand and deal with the growing problem of distrust and polarization in our political life. So just a couple of housekeeping notes. You may want to switch your Zoom setting to speaker view at this time. Also, after Professor Vallier speaks, there will be a question and answer period in which we will ask you to use the raise hand function. And then finally, Professor Vallier has agreed to make himself available for more informal conversation with students tomorrow from 1 to 2.25. If you plan to attend that meeting, please RSVP to me. I will put my email address in the chat or you can simply put your email address in the chat and we will consider that an RSVP for tomorrow's more informal conversation with Professor Vallier from 1 to 2.25. So please join me in welcoming Professor Kevin Vallier. <laughs> well, thank you all uh, for coming and uh, I, can't believe I'm <laughs> giving a lecture that so many luminaries uh, uh, have given. Um, so I, I hope to, to, to live up to it. Today, what I want to do is try to give you a, a framework for thinking about some of the political problems that we're having in the US and that points away uh, to the future and 
some kinds of reforms that might solve those problems. So really I'm gonna be talking about both ideas of institutional and social trust and political polarization and how their interplay uh, helps us to understand sort of what's going on. So I'll just sort of start uh, with some <laughs> dismal, dismal truth. So, um, so Americans are finding it harder and harder to trust one another. Social trust in the United States, our trust in our fellow citizens, faith that others will follow established norms uh, has fallen uh, dramatically. So in the mid 1960s, and here I wanna go to um, show you some little bit of data, not too much hopefully. Um, so, has gone from around 55% in the mid 60s, um, set where most people when polled said that most people could be trusted. And that figure fell to about 31% in 2018. Now this is a very big deal because in established democracies, social trust is extremely stable in most countries, UK, Sweden, it's pretty much a straight line with some fluctuations. The United States is the only established democracy that has seen anything like this large of a decline. There are other countries that have seen fluctuations and declines, but we're the only established democracy that's seen this pattern. As we'll see in a moment, this is very, very bad because social trust has very good uh, consequences. So uh, it's also the, the case that political trust, this trust in government and democracy has fallen pretty steeply as well. So throughout the 1960s, about 70% of Americans said they trusted the government in Washington all or most of the time. By the early 1990s, that number had fallen below 30%. And after a brief rebound in the early 2000s, it had collapsed to 17% in 2019. More troublesome still is that Americans reporting no confidence at all in their national government doubled from around 14% in 1995, um, then to 28% uh, in 2017. Even in 2011, about 14% of people said they couldn't trust government. But in 2017, something changed, we could probably guess, but um, it doubled. So that's very, very worrisome. Um, I'll come back to the main screen for a moment. Now we see a similarly disturbing pattern in partisan distrust. So in 2017, around 70% of Republicans said they distrusted anyone who voted for Hillary Clinton for president. Likewise, around 70% of Democrats said they distrusted anyone who voted for Donald Trump. So people not only distrust politicians from other parties, which is good in some cases and helpful and essential, <laughs> they distrust anyone who votes for the other party. That is many millions of people. So in our politically polarized age, we trust each other less simply based on how we vote. Worse, distrust is giving way to darker impulses like hatred. From 1980, when one measurement began, some members of each major political party reported that they hated the other one but they used to be far fewer in number, between 10 to 20% of each party. In 2000, something changed. Now, as many as half of the members of each party despise the other party. It's unclear how a democracy can remain stable under these conditions. I mean, we surely don't trust those we hate, and we certain don't, certainly don't wanna be ruled by them even uh, temporarily. So the other um, disturbing uh, data here is a, a Pew poll that was taken in 2018 that breaks down uh, trust levels by age. So I'm gonna just turn to it. So the most trusting Americans are over 65, whereas the least trusting are by far the youngest. So you look here, this is a measure of um, three different questions. Most of the time people just look out for themselves. Most would try to take advantage of you if they got a chance and most people can't be trusted. So what we can see here in the gray is that around 29% of people said uh, that are over 65 say most can't be trusted. That's pretty bad if you think about it, right? But around 60% of 18 to 29 year olds agreed. Okay, so the number has doubled. There's one thing that we're learning from the trust research is that trust levels tend to harden in early adulthood. There is some evidence that it can change temporarily, but we've looked now at um, Swedish immigrants. So Swedish are, the Swedes are one of the most trusting countries. Sweden is one of the most trusting countries in the world. And when younger people leave Sweden for other countries, their trust levels will, uh, will change to approximate to some degree the trust levels in their new country. Um, but once they're over 30, there's no change at all. So what this suggests is that we face a low trust future 
as we transition from higher trust generations to lower trust generations. So that's the kind of situation that we're in. Now, why does trust falling really matter? I mean, we all kind of know implicitly that it does, but, but let me just talk through some of them. And in my book, in chapter two, I go through them in, in great detail. Um, so eroding social and political trust comes with grave costs. Falling social trust can undermine democracy, dem economic growth, and economic equality at the same time, the rule of law, the protection of minorities, it can foment tribalism and bigotry, weaken our capacity to form relations of friendship and love with those outside of our political in-group, and even negatively affect personal psychological well-being. Falling political trust makes it hard to form effective public policy. It can threaten democratic government and political stability and generate excessive inequalities of power, corruption, and violations of basic rights. Now, these phenomena aren't merely abstract, so I just want to work through some very vivid cases. You know, they, they really affect us very vividly. So allow me to sort of put you in that mindset for a moment, but fair warning. So recall your experience watching uh, the hearings on Brett Kavanaugh's nomination to the Supreme Court. I'm sure you remember Christine Blasey Ford claimed that Kavanaugh assaulted her in high school, accusations Kavanaugh fiercely denied. Now, most of the people here probably watched those hearings and you were surely on one side um, or the other, completely convinced that you were correct. I was certainly of that mindset that one, one side was correct and the other was incorrect. Uh, and your friends these days, I mean, your friends probably agreed with you. Uh, most of your family probably did too. There's probably some disagreements, but just recall how you felt in that moment. So you, you may have been right, okay? But you were also polarized and you distrusted not just politicians on other sides, but supporters of those politicians. How could anybody look at this testimony and see it in a different way? So distrust and polarization occupy us socially and emotionally. This isn't just an intellectual problem. It's partly an issue in, you know, sort of our very emotional structures, right? If it was a purely intellectual problem, it would be a lot easier to address. Now we can see other consequences of falling trust as well. Arguably one recent effect of lower political trust is what political scientists call norm erosion. So norms, as we, we think about them in democracies are you know, really basic uh, things. Don't say that there was massive voter fraud, uh, facilitate the transition uh, between power, release your tax returns so that people can see whether you're on the financial up and up. Um, these aren't laws, or at least not yet, um, but um, they're norms. And when they erode, democracy erodes. So democracy is only function if they're supported by norms that Levitsky and Zeblat say are, quote, the soft guardrails of democracy, preventing day-to-day -day political competition from devolving into a no-holds-barred conflict, unquote. So we need toleration and institutional forbearance to make democracy work. Otherwise, we can't keep political losers, the temporary political losers, integrated into the political system. For example, imagine that a U.S. president made a temporary decision to deny funding to a foreign country to compel it to investigate one of his domestic political rivals, arguably with the uh, intent to boost his chances of re-election. This, if it occurred, would severely erode norms that prohibit using state power to interfere with free elections. Such actions suggest that the future will lead to, quote, more departures from unwritten political conventions and increasing institutional warfare. In other words, democracy without solid guardrails, forgive me. Um, one might see the Republican decision to confirm Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court before the 2020 election is another case of norm erosion um, following um, the refusal to hold a nomination hearing for uh, uh, Merrick Garland uh, with a Democrat threat of court packing as an attempt to respond in kind. That would be another form of norm erosion even if you think it would be justified. So here again, we're not musing about an abstract intellectual issue, right? So we're encountering a real problem we can follow on the television or the internet every hour of, uh, every hour of, of the day. So pandemic's another example. Our government developed no federal plan for coordinating treatment of the virus. They simply didn't seem to believe at the highest levels uh, and having a competent government response. So our low trust in government allowed us to elect officials who didn't trust it either. Further, we're heavily destructively polarized by an issue as simple as wearing a mask to keep people safe. What's more, we've seen unfortunately hypocritical behavior, particularly among political officials, but also even public health officials. I think one thing that caused a lot of frustration in the public was the tendency to condemn church gathering 
while refusing to recommend not attending the protests uh, in July, not to mention inconsistent recommendations. But matters came to a head on January 6th, and we'll have to forever reckon with this and how we got here. When a group of insurrectionists attempted to overturn a fair election and uh, potentially physically harm a host of high-ranking political officials due to a combination of their low trust and high polarization. So think, think about it. Okay? If these individuals were just low trust, they would have stayed home. No one could be trusted, right? And if they were just polarized, they would have at least believed the news media reporting that Trump lost the election. So it's the toxic mix of low trust and high polarization that made January 6th possible. That's why we have to bring these phenomena together. We can't just talk about polarization. If we're just polarized, but we're high trust, we can solve a lot of problems. If we're low trust, it's difficult, but at least we don't have to worry about polarization. It's when those things come together that we get a real problem. Falling trust creates even deeper problems though, including in how we form our deepest beliefs in other domains. Partisan identities increasingly drive the formation of other social commitments, such as religious affiliation. Indeed, today, partisan affiliation is more stable than religious affiliation in the United States. When with non-political identities in decline, partisan identities capture them, lining up other identities to help a political party, party defeat its opposition. For people who value these other identities, this is deeply troubling because politics is swallowing everything else. Consider this. 15 years ago or so, we saw a movement, the New Atheists, um, where they were making arguments against the rationality of theistic belief to the public. Where did it go? Um, my view is that it was swallowed primarily by uh, cultural politics. A number of the leaders got branded as right wing. The rest moved in a left wing direction. Where did the sort of open evangelical discourse go? Like the big, the big revivals that say Billy Graham ran that were very bipartisan. Um, what exactly has happened? Well, a lot of evangelical discourse went directly into support for Donald Trump. So it looks like it's sort of all, and I mean, there are, there are pastors all over the country talking about the prevalence of things like uh, nationalism and even a bit of sort of the QAnon conspiracy theory among their parishioners. So all we're coming to care about now is uh, Team Red and Team Blue. I mean, we're not even as deeply disagreeing about economic issues as usual. Um, so it's no wonder trust is on the decline, because I, as I think trust and polarization are in a kind of doom loop. Okay, so I've brought you down. Let me try to bring you back up a little bit. <laughs> so my review of the data supports the argument that we can only break polarization by restoring declining trust, and that only liberal democratic institutions can restore trust and do so justly. It looks like, in particular from what we can see with certain institutions, freedom of association, the use of markets, social safety nets, constitutional democracy, and fair and free elections can do a lot to restore trust and so to contain the damaging effects of polarization. So here I'm gonna understand liberal institutions as those that protect a broad range of individual and group liberties from interference by other citizens and by government officials. Think here of the Bill of Rights, which is a paradigmatically liberal uh, document when it's consistently applied to everyone. So constitutional democracy seems to create the most social and political trust from what I can tell with markets in section, uh, second, social safety nets in third, freedom of association fourth, electoral democracy in last place. But they all sustain social trust uh, and political trust and they do so in a just way. So for this reason, I think liberal politics has the internal resources to save us from a downward spiral of increasing polarization and decreasing trust. So what I call liberal rights practices, when we take these rights and we decide to exercise them, we can increase social and political trust and dampen partisan polarization. So we can resolve the distrust and polarization doom loop without going outside the liberal policy toolkit. That is, we really can hold on to our institutions and address these problems rather than having to do something totally different politically. So allow me to work through some examples, starting with freedom of association. We use freedom of association to form and participate in organizations that very often serve the public. So associational life can create social trust by putting youth in particular into positive contact with others that may never have uh, encountered before. Uh, it's true that people who join associations were already highly trusting, but we've seen in many domains that positive contact in social life can increase social trust. I've also argued that associational rights are morally justified to a wide range of different groups including those who would otherwise reject liberal democracy. 
because many illiberals or non-liberals place special value on community and freedom of association helps to preserve that. In my view, we can increase trust by issuing protections for organizations through legal exemptions from certain kinds of expanding progressive social legislation. So take the Equality Act right now. I do support the expansion of civil rights to um, uh, people of all sexual orientations and gender identities. Um, the worry with the Equality Act is it limits the earlier Religious Freedom Restoration Act and has too few religious exemptions. And I think this is going to exacerbate fears among many religiously conservative populations, not just white either, but in many uh, minority communities, um, that their church-run institutions are going to be um, sued um, or regulated uh, so that they can't stay in line with the teachings of their churches. There'll be exemptions for churches themselves, but church-run institutions, people who operate small businesses according to conscience, um, that's going to start to be uh, pretty limited. And in my view, something like the Utah Compromise is, is a good way to go. Um, um, so I can talk more about religious exemptions. They're sort of controversial these days. And the, it's interesting, in the early 90s, it was the right that opposed many religious exemptions and the left who supported them. Um, but things are different today. OK, so now let's turn to the market economy. Markets can be understood as exchange protected by private property in capital goods, that is the goods that make other goods, your ability to own a factory, to have an investment, uh, to run a small business. This has, this, is, this has nothing to do with what the tax rate is. Okay, so having markets, you know, Sweden has a lot of markets and they have in many ways well-protected unregulated markets um, or somewhat regulated markets, um, but they have very high taxes. So when I say legally protected property rights, I mean that people have the freedom to start a business or invest, they know where their property lines are, they can get a mortgage. Um, these are things that are not well protected in many countries um, where it takes forever to start a business. So you, you don't even know where your property lines are. So if someone you know, builds in your property, you, you, you can't take them to the small claims court. So that's the sense in which I'm defending uh, markets. I'm not talking about tax rates. I'm just talking about stable legal property rights in the law. And in these cases, free exchange aligns our incentives for gain with peaceful behavior, increasing trust. So when we have positive market interactions, we can become more trusting. So think about more developed um, market societies where you, know, you walk into a grocery store, you buy any kind of food at all, you go to the cashier, you're not worried about being ripped off. But then there are other situations where you go to buy a used car and you really aren't sure about the person that you're, you're dealing with. Um, Positive interactions can build trust over time. Negative interactions can diminish it, right? And we can see that in you know, these two kinds of economic transactions we engage in. And this may surprise you, but the, uh, the orders that appeal most to free markets are the most highly trusting uh, regimes. Um, although the reasons why are kind of more complex. Private property rights can also be justified to many perspectives because they help to promote economic growth and they allow diverse groups to work together for a common good through spontaneous coordination of people through market prices. One way, and I think many of you who have worries about the market economy, but you might agree with me on this, one way that we can expand markets to help restore trust is by lowering the price of housing, particularly in major cities. Um, this is in particular by um, making it harder for people to residentially zone things so that, for instance, you can only have single family housing in many parts of a city like San Francisco. Um, so by um, removing those real estate restrictions, which I think should be accomplished by putting a lot of real estate zoning at the state level, um, rather than the local level where they get captured by the rich, this will boost economic equality by making the poor richer, that is allowing workers to live in large cities that they couldn't live in before, but also lowering the real wealth of the rich gained through excessive uh, zoning in their favor. But at the same time, allowing for cheaper housing can increase economic growth because more people can live in productive parts of the economy. All right, now let's move on to social services. These are forms of redistribution that are largely aimed at reducing poverty and extreme social risks. Economic security helps people feel that society isn't leaving them behind, reducing resentment. And we are starting to see some new data where there do seem to be some declines in social trust from unemployment scarring. It looks like people feel that not having a job is society being indifferent to them. So you want certain kinds of protections so that people don't feel like they're being kicked to the curb. 
So social services also narrow economic inequalities that many, especially on the left, perceive as unfair. They temper the risks of the market order, making people more comfortable with markets. This is one of the reasons I think that Sweden was able to move from what we would call democratic socialism to what we call a capitalist welfare state today, because they had such strong social safety nets, people weren't as worried about the negative effects of markets because they were insulated from many of them. And I think that social services can be justified to most perspectives based on fear of poverty, recognizing extreme need, and the sense that having something to fall back on can reduce domination and control by powerful social groups. One of my favorite programs that's best empirically substantiated is the Bolsa Familia program in Brazil, which provides mothers with a cash transfer in exchange for having their children vaccinated and sending them to school. This reduced child poverty in Brazil quite a great deal, so much so that over 40 countries have, captured, uh, have copied the policy. Now let's turn to the operation of democratic governance at the congressional level. We need to reduce corruption in Congress. So HR 1, the For the People Act, before Congress now, has some provisions uh, that worry me, particularly public, broader public databases of uh, even smallish political contributions. I mean, I'd support them for very large ones, but, but Title VIII, if you look it up, has some really helpful anti-corruption measures, like requiring leading political officials to disclose their tax returns by law, making it harder for people in government to immediately get jobs in the private sector after they leave office. So there, there'll be you know, three to five years uh, in between. So you can't just go, what's, you know, go through the sort of uh, golden revolving door between private and public so easily. So they're freer from corporate control and lures in that way. I think these policies are not so hard to justify because anti-corruption legislation helps people feel that their votes matter and that government can be trusted to produce good policy. And we also, of course, need to prevent certain groups at the state level from limiting voting rights at the state level. Um, so HR1 would establish automatic voter registration. So I think people would feel secure in their ability to help select their leaders. Now, I can't address every issue, but I think that's at least something of a tour of what I argue. Uh, I'm most eager to find ways to increase trust in media, since bad reporting can relay bad information about which institutions are trustworthy. So without media trust, we can't calibrate our trust to true trustworthiness in our institutions or in one another. But we can talk about this more in the Q&A because I'm not so sure about how to reform media helpfully. So my hope overall is that increasing trust will take a large bite out of polarization since people will become more trusting of others and of government, even when the other party's in power. Uh, polarization is much less problematic under conditions of trust since people will see those who offer different policies as persons of goodwill, even if they disagree with their political agenda. So the democratic rotation of power can occur with less friction. Of course, the challenge here is how to get the process of reform in motion. That requires something of each of us. First, I think we really do have to fight our own distrust of our political opponents. Otherwise, we're likely to interpret everything they do as evil and wicked and take that as further evidence that we were right about them all along. To begin to trust, we have to reflect on our own intellectual limitations and try to adopt an attitude of humility. None of us have all the answers and every one of us is likely to be wrong on some important political issues. The other side just might help us get at the truth, at least from time to time. Second, we have to allow ourselves to recognize that our non-political interactions with our opponents are positive and give us reasons to trust them. Perhaps some of you are sealed in an ideological bubble, but most of us aren't. You probably regularly interact with some people whose politics differ from your own. You may not have even noticed that their politics are different. And the ways they treated you give you no grounds to mistrust them. Third, it's helpful to take a global perspective on our problems. Few developed liberal democratic societies face our levels of polarization and distrust, at least not to the same degree. Some not at all. And finally, we can look at our own recent past for evidence that things can get better because matters weren't always so grim. I don't think our condition is terminal. But there are two kinds of responses that I think won't work. So right-wing populism proposes a kind of American nationalism that has served as a basis for social unity in the past, typically during wars. So nationalism indeed creates social and political trust by defining the nation against some enemy or threat. Wars do bind us together and those bonds help our society survive. You can see this just by tracking the spikes in social and political trust over time, especially the decline starting in the early 1970s. Arguably World War II, we can't prove this, was trust creating, whereas Vietnam was trust reducing. 
Um, the right wing populist argues that uh, increasing national sentiment in the right ways will create World War II effects rather than Vietnam effects. But we don't want to base trust on constant welfare, warfare. And in times of peace, nationalist leaders tend to search for a new foe, typically an enemy within the nation, people who don't fit the interpretation of national identity held by those with political power. These efforts may increase trust among people who fit the nationalist definition of the nation, but they'll decrease trust between the nationalist in-group and his inevitable out-group. This isn't the way to create trust among all Americans. Suppose again, just for example, a US president were to lead a public chant to send a female Muslim Congresswoman of color back to her country of origin. <clears throat> that may create fellow feeling among the president's supporters, but it frustrates trust among people with different genders, ethnicities, and faiths. But I will say, and not to equate the two, but that we do need to look at both sides as part of this project, that left-wing social egalitarianism also creates some dangers for trust. This view holds not merely that persons are equal, but here's the key, that disagreement about how equality applies in matters of things like gender identity is unreasonable, and that such views should be socially and even legally repressed. So the thought, the thought here is it's one thing to support expanding the circle of social equality. It's one thing to dismiss those who deny this as bigoted. Okay, so this view, it isn't gonna sow distrust among immigrants and citizens, but it does still tribalize us between the groups that are sort of get it and the groups that don't get it. So social egalitarians can sometimes demonize more privileged members of society, as opposed to calling attention to injustices and the reform required to produce them. And in some cases, we've seen some egalitarians denounce people who aren't especially privileged, uh, like white working class males without college degrees uh, and very religious citizens. So these are trust reducing practices, in my opinion. So in his book that's now well known, Patrick Deneen argues that to call for the cures of liberalism's ills by applying more liberal measures is tantamount to throwing gas on a raging fire. It will only deepen our political, social, economic, and moral crisis, unquote. But if I'm right, we really do need more liberalism. If we protect central liberal rights and support those who exercise them, we can overcome the mistrust and conflict that some claim liberalism engenders by nature. So we have to resist different kinds of illiberal forces, double down on the institutions that we have, recognizing that they're flawed, but that they can be improved. Now I'm alive to the non-liberal concern that liberalism as an ideology has deleterious social effects. A liberal ethos can become sectarian and authoritarian and beating up on those with more traditional social and political views or those on the left. And it can often be seen as socially atomizing destroying older social bonds that are hard to replace. But I have no interest in defending liberalism as an ethos. Instead, what I'm doing is defending liberal rights practices, right? constitutional rights and their exercise. And in my view, liberalism's contemporary critics haven't shown that we can only have liberal institutions if we have a liberal ethos. In my view, and just to try to end on a, a high note, with that we should be proud of liberal civilization, the gradual, very difficult progress that has been made. And we have good reason to hope that liberal orders have the internal resources to end the cold civil war that we're currently waging against one another. So maybe we soon return to the irritating, exhausting, and deeply flawed politics of liberal democracy. So through liberal reforms, we can, paraphrasing Sigmund Freud, turn our hysterical polarized misery into common uh, political unhappiness. So with any luck, that's, I've tried to give you a sort of framework for thinking about how trust and polarization work together for ill, um, but that how distrust and polarization, but then how they might uh, be uh, addressed together um, within uh, the institutions that we have. So thank you very much. I uh, very much appreciate uh, your attention and your time.